Hi, good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for waking up, coming out to listen to me speak. Uh, and I also want to thank Facebook for acknowledging our work. We got runner-up in the Internet Defense Award, so thank you very much for that. Uh, as he said, I'm Chad Spensky. I'm actually the second author on this work, so I want to embrace the local culture first and say I'm sorry for being here. Uh, I really wish you guys could have got to meet Machiri. He's really the mastermind behind all this. So if I can't answer your questions satisfactorily, please email him. He's a really great guy. Uh, he did not get his visa in time, so he got the American on the paper. So before I tell you about the paper, I first want to tell you a story about the name, because it comes up a lot. Why is it called Dr. Checker, right? So when Machiri first proposed this work, he made a directory, right? The normal person would probably call this driver checker. We're going to make a static analysis tool that looks at kernel drivers. So this is how I would have made the directory. Machiri did this, make dir dr underscore checker as an abbreviation for driver. So go for, fast forward you know, to the point where we submit the paper. An hour before you know, the submission's done, Machiri brings up, hey, should we change the paper title from the working title to a real title? All of the rest of the co-authors are like, what do you mean? It's Dr. Checker. And he's like, well, that was supposed to be an abbreviation for driver, and you guys just called it Dr. Checker, and I just kind of went with it. So that's why we presented the paper called Dr. Checker. Um, that it was a working title that made it all the way through. So why did we decide to look at drivers? Um, so Machiri is a, a pretty excellent bug finder. He has tons of CVs to his name, and he's been looking at Linux kernel code for a while. And it turns out that when you look for bugs in Linux kernel, the drivers just jump out at you. There's a lot of third-party code in there. It's not as well audited. And uh, historically, there's been a lot of work in this area that seems to indicate that most of the vulnerabilities are coming from third-party drivers. Back in 2003, there was a paper that showed that in Windows XP, there was about 85% of the, the bugs were coming from third-party drivers. We did our own analysis. We actually looked at all the CVEs over the past year to see where, where they're being reported. It looks like the mainline Linux kernel is actually doing pretty good as far as drivers are concerned. There's only about 28% of the CVEs in the past year were in the, Linux, uh, were in the kernel drivers. However, there was a presentation given in 2016 at the Linux Security Summit by somebody on the Android security team, and it looks like the trend literally repeated itself verbatim on mobile kernels. So this was a real, a real motivating example of, you know, maybe we should look at drivers again, right? It seems like there, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of bugs in here, and it's really hard code to analyze. So the approach we decided to take, um, we're going to go with a program analysis. We're doing static analysis because most of this kernel code, we're able to get the source code, a lot of GPL licenses and things. If you email the companies, go through some steps, they'll actually give you full source code, including their third-party drivers. So the type of analysis we decided to do was first we're going to do points to analysis. So this is going to determine all the storage locations any pointer could ever point to by the end of the program. So for example, if there's a kernel pointer that points to something in user memory, that could be an exploitable bug that we could leverage. And the other one is taint analysis. So this is trying to determine the propagation of data through the program flow as it's executing. So if we're giving it user input, we want to see all the places that that input touches to see if we can you know, change control flow in some interesting way. So an example here would be some user provider data used in a dangerous function like copy from user, maybe as a length field, and we can get a buffer overflow in the kernel and crash the system and maybe exploit it. And one of the insights in this paper is that really with just these two analyses, you can implement a ton of different bug detectors on top of them. And you'll see as I talk about the paper, but these are really the only two core analysis, and everything is built just using the output from these two types of analyses. Turns out there's a problem when you try to do program analysis on kernel code, though. The first one, uh, we want to do pointer analysis, but there are pointers everywhere. There are functions to find as pointers. There's pointers pointing to pointers. And when you try to do static analysis on this, your state explosion goes through the roof. It's very hard to analyze. And there's a ton of inner procedural calls to core functions. So you'll look at a very small function in the kernel driver, but then it calls a kernel function that calls a kernel function. And next thing you know, this very small function has this huge state explosion, and your analysis never finishes. So these are really the, the two core things that we tried to tackle in Dr. Checker. And the problem that you're facing anytime you're doing static analysis 
this idea of precision versus soundness. So if you have a precise analysis, all of the results that you want um, are, are returned here as true. So these are true positives and then false positives. If it's a precise analysis, most of the results you get are going to be true. But you will have some of the true things not identified, right? Very good. You get high accuracy. Most of the things that you get back are good results. However, in most program analysis, they, they really strive to be sound. And what this means in a sound analysis is that everything that is true was returned. So if there was a bug, no questions asked. We reported it, but you get a ton of false positives. So you now have to dig through you know, hundreds of thousands of warnings, for example, just to find those three bugs that you're looking for. Brendan Dolan Gavitt actually alluded to this in his idea of presenting, putting more bugs in software, right? So that if you have a sound analysis, it'll blow them up. So we actually decided to adopt the notion of soundiness. So Ben Lipschitz proposed this about two years ago, so we'll credit him for the word and the weird title on our paper. But the idea in soundiness is that you'll take a sound analysis and you'll, make a couple, you'll break a couple assumptions that break soundness to make it practical in, in a real-world application, but still keeping very high precision. So th this was the goal in Dr. Checker. So we started with a sound analysis and then just sort of broke it in very small places to make sure it was practical on real-world uh, driver code. So the assumptions we made, these are the three that break the soundness of static analysis. So one, we assume that all non-third-party driver code is implemented perfectly. As we saw historically, the Linux kernel is pretty well vetted. There's a lot of people looking at it. And the bugs seem to be disappearing in the Linux kernel code. So I'm sure this isn't a true statement, but for the purpose of our analysis, it's really one of the core things that made it possible. The other one is we try to optimize our loops. So rather than optimizing them to a fixed point, we would optimize them until the reaching definition reaches a fixed point or the longest use step chain. Every time I say that, it confuses me, and I have to go to a whiteboard and reconvince myself that it's true, but I've done that multiple times, and we're very convinced that it's true. Uh, we can talk offline if you're not convinced of that. But, uh, and then the other one is that we only traverse every function call exactly once, even if it's in a loop. So again, this is for practical analysis, so we can actually do you know, large-scale code analysis. And sort of the, the idea behind all of these is because we're doing taint propagation and pointer analysis, is that even when you're in the loop, if the taint's going to propagate, it doesn't matter how many times, uh, sort of intuitively, that if it gets to a vulnerable function, that's really what, all you need to know, right? That you can get data to that vulnerable function, and we don't really look for stateful bugs, and that's one of our limitations of our work. So the design of Dr. Checker, we definitely wanted this to be a very flexible tool. So uh, it's a very modular framework. So in fact, as we were writing the paper, there was a type of bug that kept coming up with um, global variables that I think in the last week of writing the paper, we're like, wow, we should implement a detector, implemented it, found, I think, 11 more bugs or something that you'll see in the final slide. But it's really modular, really easy to you know, take an idea, write it down, rerun your analysis, and get results. Uh, and it's also one of the first tools that can simultaneously employ numerous vulnerability detectors. So it wasn't designed for a specific type of bug, but it does a basic static analysis pass over the code, and then your detectors can you know, consume the data that we're outputting and look for new types of bugs. We've also open sourced the entire project. It is on GitHub as of yesterday morning, I believe. So we hope that this becomes a collaborative tool. And there's some ideas to maybe do some, some work in the future and incorporate it with an IDE and make it a little fancier. So the general design of our modular framework, uh, we're going to take the driver source code. We're first going to parse it into all the data structures. So the control flow graph, all of our internal data structures that are going to store all of the state. As it's running this traversal, so as we're traversing the control flow, control flow graph, we're going to constantly be calling out to our two types of analyses, so points to and our taint analysis, that are actually going to share the same global state. So th this is a pretty core concept into how our vulnerability detectors work. So they're both constantly updating all of the pointer and taints analysis. And then these are actually all the vulnerability detectors that we implemented in the paper. So improper taint use, um, taint loop boundary detector, the global vary erase detector, that's the one we implemented while we're writing the paper, but you know, basic types of bugs that would appear. 
So once these run on the analysis, again using the state from our static analysis engines, they will then output warnings. And then these are for the humans to go through and decide whether or not this is a bug worth looking at or submitting to Google or if we should just ignore it and it's a false positive. So I want to walk you through an example. Oh, sorry before that, my bad. <laughs> How we designed this, so there were, there were three core things that we wanted in our static analysis. So one, we wanted to be context sensitive. So this means that if a function is called from multiple different call points, we wanted to recognize that. So we wanted our output to the users to actually let them trace exactly how to reproduce this bug. Um, another one is field sensitivity. So there's tons of structures in kernel codes, and some analysis will just output, you know, this structure is tainted and this led to the vulnerability. But the way we implemented Dr. Checker is it's actually field sensitive. So it'll tell you the exact field in that structure that caused the vulnerability. And if the field isn't tainted, we won't trigger. So it really helped reduce false positives and give a little more rich feedback in our warnings. Uh, the other one is flow sensitivity. So this is, we're actually going through the control flow graph, propagating taint all the way through. So then when we get to the bug, we can output that entire flow of data that caused the bug. So you can have some assurance that, you know, that's probably a true positive. Now I'd like to walk you through an example. So this is a, a very small little snippet of a fake kernel driver that we're going to show you exactly how uh, Dr. Checker would work on this analysis. So first, we identify the entry points of this kernel driver, and we will, no we will mark these two input variables as tainted. We will then go through the analysis line by line. Because we're doing a field-sensitive analysis, there's some structure called current data, and it's going to set the item equal to this you know, other structure called KO for kernel object. Right now, nothing interesting happens. We then advance through the code. We see exactly here what we don't want is that the length variable is being used in a dangerous function copy from user, and it's copying it into that kernel object. So our analysis will recognize, one, that this is a bad use of taint, and two, it will recognize that the current data item field is now tainted as well because we just copied into, the, into that field. We then go through the loop analysis. We'll get a warning here that there's a tainted loop boundary. So this means that the user can control the loop and potentially you know, put it into an infinite loop or have, a, have an overrun. As we advance through, it calls an internal function. So this is going to be our context sensitivity. We're going to actually traverse the internal function because this is part of the third-party driver code, propagating the taint all the way through the function. And we see that all this is doing is adding one which again, we will throw a warning because there's tainted arithmetic happening here, and you could potentially get a uh, integer overflow. Propagating through, uh, we now see that there's a dangerous function called, an arbitrary dangerous function, but it's called on current data, which one of the fields is tainted, but buff is not actually tainted. So this is our field sensitivity reducing a false positive right here because we will not trigger a warning. However, when we call it on item, we again will get a warning of improper tainted data. And then finally, it calls some core kernel function, which again, we ignore because we assume that it's perfectly implemented and bug free, and our analysis would be finished at this point. So to highlight where our assumptions come into play and why this is an optimized way to analyze kernel drivers, first is the loop traversal. We're only gonna evaluate this loop exactly once, and we're only going to evaluate the uh, the function call within the loop exactly once. So this traversal will be extremely fast, even though the, the count could be you know, an arbitrary value and put by the user, and we ignore kernel functions, so we have no state explosion traversing through all of these core kernel functions. So how do we identify these vendor drivers? Um, we literally use diff and grep uh, with some manual effort. So most of these kernels are you know, branched off the mainline source, so we'll literally take, do the opposite of this picture here, and we'll take that source, diff it with the mainline kernel, and see what appeared. And a lot of third-party vendors also have keywords and configuration files that we're able to parse and really rip out just, those, uh, just the driver files out of their, their modifications. And of these entry points, there are really four types that we have to handle. Uh, the first is file operations. This one's extremely common, so you sort of read and write to a file and slash dev, and it'll do some kernel things. The other one is attribute operations. 
uh, socket operations, and then some of these kernels we notice actually will implement their own custom wrapper function. So there's a function you call that will then handle all of the interactions with the driver sort of indirectly. And for all of these types of entry points, we needed to annotate whether the taint was direct or indirect for our analysis. So direct is that the user is exactly passing in data that will be handled by the driver. So this is the example I gave, where you're giving it a pointer and a length, for example, in a file operation or an ioctal. The other ones are indirect, where you're passing in a structure that likely has a pointer, well, in our case, definitely has a pointer, to some kernel function, or sorry, some user-controlled data. And these, unfortunately, just took a lot of some manual effort in actually understanding these functions and these structures. And after the manual effort, we have it somewhat automated now. So if new kernels come up, it shouldn't be that big of a deal to augment them. So for our analysis, we opted to go for four different kernels. As you can see, we actually analyzed far more than four, four kernels because of the, the number of devices. But we really, uh, we lumped them all, so make sure we're not overinflating our results and say we're finding, you know, five bugs in MediaTek when it's really only one core driver, I mean one core kernel, but we wanted to make sure to get all of the different drivers. So in our paper, these are lumped in to just these four types of kernels and all of their associated drivers. It was a total of 3.1 million lines of code that we were able to analyze. Um, as a comparison, we wanted to look at what other tools, how they would perform on this exact code base that we were able to obtain. Uh, the four that we picked, our criteria was that they had to be easy to use because we didn't want to waste years trying to compile them and figure out how they work, and mature tools that we think you know, would be used in practice. That's really the, the market that we were trying to get into with Dr. Checker. We wanted this to be a practical tool. So Flaw Finders, a pattern-based bug detector. Rats is very similar, pattern-based. Sparse is actually built into the GCC compiler. You can add a special flag and some annotations. There's actually a ton of annotations already in the Linux kernel. And CPP check advertises itself as an all-in-one static analysis bug detector. Uh, they're all relatively easy to install, uh, pretty easy to use, and gave us a ton of warnings. Um, just as a quick sort of checkbox of you know, how they compare to Dr. Checker, uh, as you can see, none of them are sound. So in practical bug finding, soundness really can't coexist with humans analyzing the bugs. Um, we really wanted no manual annotations. It seems like most of the other tools agreed with us there. But you can see the, the ability to handle pointers, enter procedural calls, um, tractable warnings that we, we really tried to stand out in making this a very useful, very practical tool. Um, the other thing that we were really pushing for is we wanted the warnings to be, you know, a, for a human to be able to, to parse through them. So we wanted to see how many warnings these other ones threw. We didn't actually go through these, so we don't know how many bugs they found. We only were able to compare them to the bugs that we found and see if this tool found them as well. Um, I think CPP check found something like 2221, but uh, they did not find the 158 that we were able to detect with Dr. Checker. And you can see that tools like Flaw Finder uh, digging through 44,900 warnings is pretty cumbersome and you know, could probably take you a couple weeks or months. So, and Dr. Checker, I copy this up here because this is the table from the paper in case we need to go back for, for questions, but I'll highlight just a couple cells in here. So first is the bottom right. This is our absolute total on the 3.1 million lines of code. We rose, uh, we had 5,071 warnings. Of those, we did manually verify all of them. Luckily, I'm not that good of a hacker, so the other three authors who are far more savvy with exploitation verified them. I did not have to deal with that. Of those 3,070, 3,973 were true positives, meaning that this was definitely a bug in the program. So our precision is 78%, which we think is pretty spectacular. And of those, 158 were actually zero-day bugs. So the reason for this huge gap between the 4,000 and the 158 is that because we're a context-sensitive analysis, if there's a bug that's called by multiple functions, we will raise a warning for every single one of those functions. So for the bugs that were deeper within the code, even though it was just one bug, we could potentially get hundreds or you know, a thousand warnings depending on the code, but that's the reason for, the, for this huge gap. It's not that you know, our tool does something crazy, but it's, uh, it's sort of expected that you would have that. And there's some post-processing that you could do to actually shrink that down so the human doesn't have to analyze all of them. We sort of did that manually, but... Um, the other one was, uh, I just wanted to highlight the, the kernel unit memory leak detector. 
So this is the case where you have uh, like a padded st uh, a structure with padding, and you don't zero it out. So then when you pass that structure back to uh, user space, it leaks some kernel memory. So this one was highly efficient. I mean, we had 24 warnings, 15 true positives, and 11 zero-day bugs. So some of these detectors, you know, they don't hit very often, but when they do, they're, they're pretty accurate. Uh, and this one I want to point out, this case as well, this tainted point dereference checker. So this was most of, you know, a lot of our false positives came from here. And the reason being that there are really two main function uh, driver entry points where we, the pointer analysis just blew up and sort of said everything points to everything. And that was the reason for, you know, a couple hundred of our false positives right there. And just these two driver entry points that our analysis, because we broke soundness, just sort of blew up in our face. Um, so, you know, we found quite a few zero-day bugs, so I figure I might as well, you know, wet the whistle and give you one here that Dr. Checker discovered. This one is not super interesting, because I wanted one that could fit on a slide and didn't want to, you know, throw a whole wall of code at you guys. But you'll see this is actually uh, an overflow bug in one of MediaTek's drivers. This one has been reported and is patched as uh, the best of our knowledge. So you can see here that buff can actually detain, contain more than one character, but everything in the code, explicitly the scanf, assumes that it's only ever going to have a character. So Dr. Checker actually rose a warning here, so this was improper tainted data use. And you can see in the code that the programmer is actually aware of this. They actually check ref to make sure that it worked, but it's far too late because we already had our buffer overflow right here in our sprintf. So you know, not, not the most awesome example. There are more in the paper that are a little more complex, but you know, a real world use case where this found a real zero day bug. So uh, one of the questions that sort of came up when we were doing this work, you know, we make these soundy assumptions, but it'd be great, you know, we gotta make sure that they're actually helping us, right? That, you know, a sound analysis isn't gonna just work and, you know, we're foolish for trying to do all this work. So uh, you'll see here on the x-axis is the time taken to finish the analysis is actually in log scale, so it's even, you know, bigger than it looks. So in the top case was Dr. Checker. We took 100 randomly sampled entry points. So this is not on the 3.1 million lines of code, just 100 randomly sampled ones. Um, you'll see that the maximum it took to analyze a uh, driver entry point was about 1,000 seconds. The min is very fast. So then we did it just without our loop optimization to see if our loop optimization was actually buying us anything. And it seems like it's buying us quite a bit, right? There's about a, a 3x uh, speed up that we're getting there from 1,000 to 3,000. And the distributions look, you know, roughly the same as far as the median. But then you'll see when we try to do it as a sound analysis, the time goes up, you know, exponentially. And in fact, 82 of these analyses didn't even finish when you try to do it as a sound analysis traversing through the kernel. And we couldn't even compile most of them in LLVM to even do the analysis correctly because of all of the, the crazy stuff going on in the kernel. So to make this a realistic thing as a sound analysis, I don't know, maybe quantum computers can help us down the road, but it doesn't seem like a likely uh, result anytime soon. So in conclusion, Dr. Tector is a modular bug finding tool for Linux kernel drivers. Uh, we think we're the first ones to actually call our program analysis soundy. So we have soundy program analysis techniques to maintain practicality and really produce you know, real-world useful results. It's a scalable tool uh, capable of employing multiple vulnerability detectors. We think this is a, a pretty cool point that we'd like to highlight. We found 158 previously undisclosed zero-day bugs in this work, and it's open source for the world, and we would love to see some development and some collaboration from you all and hopefully we can help make drivers great again. So uh, there's our link. If you have any really technical questions, please email Arvind. If you have any fluffier questions, I would love to feel useful, so you can email me, and uh, I'll take any questions at this point. All right, questions? <coughs> Next talk. Uh, my question is on the uh, inter-procedure analysis. So do you consider the loop in the core graph? Because it will also get you 
uh, not to the fixed point. It's like kind of the loop in the function. So you mean a, a loop? Yeah, if you, there's a loop in the call graph because you are doing context sensitive analysis. So you still cannot uh, like uh, reach to the fixed point of your static analysis. In the loop? Uh, loop in the call graph. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So have you ever considered to either unroll the loop in a call graph or like uh, set a fixed number of analysis? So we'll only evaluate the, new, the loop until the longest u step chain is reached of all of the, the variables in that loop? Is that what you're asking? Uh, in, no errors, so we can talk off that. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Are you saying if like the strongly connected components have jumped back to each other? Like uh, a loop yeah. with loops in it? Right. Um, I think that might be a mature question. Yes, we can handle it. And uh, <laughs> Zmail's right there. <laughs> okay, yeah, we, we, we can talk offline. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Deborah Shans from National Science Foundation. Um, I just have, oh, I'll ask you a fluffy question. Oh, that, thank you. Okay, so um, if you look at the, uh, the drivers in the, um, the mobile space and in the, in these systems you're looking at. Okay, so a lot of the um, a lot of the drivers in the you know desktop space are in better shape at this point, right? Yep. What are you seeing in terms of the types of bugs you're spotting in the mobile environment in terms of the drivers? That you know, what's what's causing this huge gap, right? Is it just because they're new, or is it because there's something about the mobile environment that's different the types of bugs you're finding or the kinds of code you're looking at? Yes, I mean, I think the, I don't have a definitive answer, but a hypothesis, right? It's just that it's a really fast moving area and there's a lot of different peripherals popping up and a lot of cool features that people want to use. So, you know, if it works, you want to ship it sooner than later. And yeah, I mean, everyone's been really cool with us when we submit these bugs and they're, you know, very open to all of our feedback. That it's been really awesome working with all the vendors. But yeah, I think just because it's a lot of the, the third-party code that just it's newer, right? It just hasn't been looked at as much, and it's fresh code. Is it possibly that some of the people who are the organizations or the individuals who are developing the device drivers for this for these devices are different than the one the people who developed? I mean, who who maybe learned? I, I don't know. I'm just I'm I'm just looking for a hypothesis yeah. here. Yeah, I don't know. The fact that this? it literally is like you know 85% again, like you know, a decade and a half later, it's I think drivers are really hard to write. And they're like, <laughs> so I, I think that they stabilize after you write one and then sort of iron it out over time, right? But writing a new driver, I think, is just hard. So these are all new drivers, new systems. I think that's probably the main reason. Okay. Hi, Francesco Gotto from Facebook. Um, so um, one question, what I miss in your talk is what is specific to drivers or your analysis? So I get the motivation for doing drivers. I don't get what is really specific to analyzing drivers, say, let's yeah, so the, this application. Th this can be ported to any other code that's similar. So the, the driver specific thing is that they're very bite-sized pieces of code, right? So that they're very isolated. And our main assumption is that we're not going to traverse calls into the core kernel function, I mean core kernel functionality. So if there's any other you know, types of things that come up that you can do that with, that you don't have to look into the whole code base, the same technique would work. Yeah, you know. I would say that this is also true for application services, or I think you can always put a, a boundary and I say, I don't look at the boundary, so. Yeah. Because yeah, so our technique is not bound to drivers by any means. We specifically wanted to look at drivers because, mm -hmm. you know, they're in the kernel, they run at high privilege, and all, you know, findings seem to indicate there's a lot of bugs there that, you know, we think should be okay. fixed. So, and a quick comment. So the assumption that you do, they are usually called as bounded model checking. The fact that you unroll the loop, the fact that when you treat mutual recursion, you only see it once, the other things. It's, okay. it's what they usually do in bounded model checking, so. Awesome. <laughs> Any other questions? So I have a final question. Uh, you mentioned uh, uh, your analysis is context sensitive yep. for function call, and you also mentioned 
when you encounter loop, you only analyze function call once. Mm -hmm. So would that contradict your uh, your technique? So I mean, <laughs> if if in the loop body there are some other function call twice, but with different arguments or something, so you only analyze loop the function once. Um, so I mean, the argument should stay the same, right? And I mean, what do you mean with different arguments? Oh, so I, I was saying. Uh, so it's called with AB, and then it's later called with BC. Maybe right. So because you you you're, you're saying you only analyze. Yeah. You, yeah. If, if function is called in the loop, you only analyze that function once. If it's different arguments, we would treat it as a different. Okay. Yeah. Call. Right. That's yeah, what but, I just But to. otherwise, we just we really want to see where the taint is able to propagate to is is the assumption. So yeah, if you call it with AB and call it with BC, it would be two different. Yeah, yeah. I just want to. Get a clarification on that. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. And it's, the, it's the call site that we only analyze once, not the actual function name. I see. Yeah. So. Yeah. Cool. All right. So let's thank Charlie one more time.